deer have received extended ranges, while men have been hunted within a narrower and still narrower circle. One after one, the liberties of the people have been cloven down, and the oppressions are daily on the increase. The clearance and dispersion of the people is pursued by the proprietors as a settled principle, as an agricultural necessity, just as trees and brushwood are cleared from the wastes of America or Australia, and the operation goes on in a quiet, business-like way. In this chapter, Marx looks at the long historical process of how people were removed from their land over a period of around 500 years. He begins with a sketch of the class structure of medieval England, noting that towards the 15th century, serfdom had pretty much disappeared. Feudal bailiffs had been replaced by independent farmers, and the population was mainly made up of yeomen, or independent peasants, who would labour on their own land for their own subsistence, while also engaging in some labour on their own land to pay their land rent. Most notably, peasants also shared a vast majority of land in common, for raising cattle, chopping down wood, fishing in rivers, etc, etc. Communal property, always distinct from the state property, was an old Teutonic institution, which lived on under cover of feudalism. We have seen how the forcible usurpation of this, generally accompanied by the turning of arable into pasture land, begins at the end of the 15th and extends into the 16th century. But at that time, the process was carried on by means of individual acts of violence, against which legislation, for 150 years, fought in vain. Marx now examines some key historical periods and events of the expulsion of peasants and craftspeople from the land and its resulting effects. Towards the end of the 15th century, we see the dissolution of the bands of feudal retainers as the monarchy, feudal lords and nobility fought amongst themselves for absolute power. This period was also largely where the development and expansion of wool manufacturing began, both raising the price of wool and also turning land into sheep pastures. During the Reformation in the 16th century, the majority of property and monasteries owned by the Catholic Church were broken up and either given to various sections of the royal family or sold to the wealthy elite for very cheap. During this process, all the peasants living on those lands were expelled. The glorious revolution of William of Orange in the 17th century saw further theft of vast amounts of state-owned lands that were then given away to the wealthy elite, creating landlords. In the 18th century, British Parliament, dominated by landed and capitalist profit grubbers, finally passed into law official bills for the enclosure of common lands as the law itself now became the instrument by which the people's land was stolen. And finally, in the 19th century, now that nearly all common land was now enclosed, all that was left was for the driving off of the agricultural labourers that remained on those lands. This process, Marx notes, involved the destruction of all housing, so that agricultural labourers could no longer find any space on the soil they cultivate even the space for their own living. One of the most extreme processes Marx discusses took place in Scotland. The Duchess of Sutherland, with the aid of British soldiers, appropriated around 800,000 acres of land, forcing people to move to the seashore for their livelihoods. However, these seashores were then removed from them as they were instead rented out to London's fishing merchants. Marx also notes that the vast amounts of land that they were originally expelled from was simply turned into deer hunting forests, purely to be used for sport by the wealthy elite. Throughout this whole process described by Marx in this chapter, we essentially see the destruction of one system of property and it being replaced by another, as the peasantry was thrown onto the labour market, while around 12 million acres, or about half of England's total agricultural land that was once used in common, now instead became enclosed, either by direct acts of parliament 
or by private interests. The spoilation of the church's property, the fraudulent alienation of the state domains, the theft of the common lands, the usurpation of feudal and clan property and its transformation into modern private property under circumstances of ruthless terrorism. All these things were just so many idyllic methods of primitive accumulation. They conquered the field for capitalist agriculture, incorporated the soil into capital, and created for the urban industries the necessary supplies of free and rightless proletarians.